This week, our visit to Jacksonville, Florida, plus some newbie RVer mistakes to avoid. This is the RV Miles Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by L.L. Bean, who makes it easy and fun to simply step outside. That might mean breaking a speed record in a rugged, built-for-fun sonic snow tube, walking an extra block in a warm, weather-resistant down jacket, or just taking a breath on your doorstep before cozying up in a quilted sweatshirt. For however you experience the outdoors, shop clothing and gear at llbean.com. Be an outsider. Welcome to episode number 233 of RV Miles. I'm Jason. And I'm Abby. And we are two full-time RVers who, along with our three boys, have been crisscrossing North America on one epic road trip since 2016. Here at RV Miles, we talk all things RV and outdoors, from travel destinations to industry news, national parks, and a whole lot more. We are coming to you from Orlando, Florida again. Yes, we headed back down to the Orlando area. Our last couple days here in Florida, we are headed yep. out of Florida on Sunday. It's been nice. It's been a good winter, but we're ready to get away from Florida. And we are getting our first real taste of summer weather this Saturday. It's going to be almost 90 degrees. And for those of you watching, on one ear inside one microphone is actually my AirPod because I'm on hold with Disney. So yeah. I'm podcasting while I'm on hold with Disney, I've been on hold for an hour and 47 minutes. Now, we're not actually going back to Disney World. No, no we're going to the water park. We're, we intend on going to the water park yes. on Saturday because it is going to be so hot. Yes. And so I have uh, some questions for them about that, some things that we would like to be able to do. I have Jason, I have me in an ear, and then I have the Disney music on a loop as well. I'm so. not quite sure what we're thinking because we're going on the Saturday of Easter weekend, but it'll be fine. Well, that's why I'm on the phone hoping we can get a cabana. <laughs> we right. will see. We've got a lot to talk about our visit to Jacksonville, which was a whole lot of fun on this episode, but we wanted to kick it off with uh, some tips from an article from our friends over at Togo RV. This article is written by Carrie Cox, and it's 10 mistakes beginner RVers should avoid. It starts off with not buying the right RV for you. And I think that's something a lot of people are afraid of, right? When they right. start the process, obviously you want to buy the best RV, but a lot of people, we've talked about this many times in the past that people get suckered in by things that aren't necessarily right for them. Yeah, or you just get uh, swept up in the moment and maybe end up with something that's a little outside your budget or doesn't quite fit the tow vehicle that you have. And then there's all of that that needs to happen. That's just one of those where you really need to go in laser focused and stick with it. Number two is waiting to book campsites. Uh -oh. We know it's a lot harder to book campsites right now than it was a couple years ago. So it is important to book as soon as possible. And perhaps some new RVers don't realize that until they get into it. Perhaps some old RVers also <laughs> don't realize that. Although I will say I did just book a campground today for February 2023. And that kind of hurt my heart a little bit. But it was also great because I got what I wanted. All right. So this is another really great one that I think uh, we all learn really quick isn't going to happen. And that is relying on campground connectivity. Now, campgrounds are getting better about this. They are recognizing that there's more digital nomads on the road. But there it is. There's more digital nomads on the road. So a lot of times campgrounds, if everybody's on it at a peak time, and we're all trying to stream Bridgerton, it's just chaos. What a lot of people don't realize is campgrounds could spend hundreds of thousands on Wi-Fi systems, and they do. If the only service provider in their area only can offer them so much, they're limited to that. Mm -hmm. And that's really a problem in a lot of rural places. Now, we, we have our new Starlink system, which is awesome, and we'll <laughs> talk about that more in the future. But yeah. what some people I think don't realize too with Starlink, that's actually going to help some campgrounds that are more remote mm -hmm. bring 
internet to their customers because they can also be Starlink customers. Yeah, just to recognize, even if you're trying to hotspot to your own phone or you're like, but I'm bringing my internet with me. It just, especially in those rural areas, there's just not always going to be as strong a signal as you need it to be. So you're going to just have to kind of be flexible. This is another great one that has gotten us into some trouble, but also us into some surprise campsites as well. And that is not calculating the length of the campsite. We've talked about this a few times, how often campsites measure maybe a little bit differently than we would measure it's a crapshoot you don't know know sometimes you're like i I, you book a campsite that says it's 35 feet long and you get to it and it's clearly like 70 feet long you've got all the room in the world and then another one is measured exactly to the length and you don't know what to do we have talked a lot about in the past about we look on google maps and try to look to see if there's overhang in the back and try to read reviews of people that stayed in those campsites and see how they thought they were measured. It's difficult, but you need to know, at least need to know your actual length of your RV, which really does involve getting out and measuring it. All right, let's do a couple more before we take a break here. Not, (laughs) I like this one, not expecting an audience while parking. You are always going to have an audience. You may not even be able to see them, yeah. but I guarantee you somebody They're is watching you. Window. Yes. Our next door neighbor, when we pulled into this campsite, decided Boy. that he was going to get right up in there and just stood there next to us. I mean... Uh, no, he was. he really felt the need to talk to me about uh, what I was doing. He didn't seem to trust that I was aware of or capable of being able to help get you into this site. It was very aggressive, very fast. He was on us within 10 seconds. Now, sometimes people, they're not coming over to help. They're just staring and you do you get a little nervous it's like you're on stage for the first time and everybody's watching you and you feel like you're being a little judged maybe one of the best things to remember we all do it they had to park themselves and hey maybe watching you they learn something but you gotta ignore those people as carrie mentions in here when you feel you have an audience backing in or pulling into a campsite that can really fluster people and that's when mistakes can often happen and we are trying to be better about this and i should by we i I do mean me of if you have someone who works at the campground or someone like a neighbor who comes over and who is stepping into your space and trying to tell you all how to do it it is okay to say to them kindly thank you so much for the advice but You know, I have for us, it would be I, you know, I've got him here on speakerphone and we have a little bit of a system down. So I would we really need to stick to that. And, you know, that's how we get safely into our spots. It's okay to tell someone no, thank you if they ask if you want help or even when they just start offering the help without asking you. All right, let's grab one more here and. I like this one because we've actually written an article about this ourselves, and it's something we've talked about a lot, and that is not pacing your road trips. We get questions, especially in the America's National Parks Facebook group, that's like, hey, I want to hit the Utah Mighty Five, and I've got two and a half days to do it. Is Can I get that done in time? And some people are like, yeah, totally, and others are... Absolutely not. Yeah, or they. I mean, do you want to see the parks? Those are that's usually the question. Are you interested in seeing the parks, or are you just there for the stamp? Or they've saved all their money and they're doing a big two week epic road trip, and mm-hmm. they're they're spending a lot of money on it, and they're trying to. They're from the east, maybe, and trying to cover everything from Los Angeles up to Washington and Glacier National Park and Yellowstone and beyond, and you, they end up spending their whole time driving. Yeah, and you hate to be that person that says, look, I know you've been looking forward to this trip for years and you're trying to do everything because you don't know if you're going to be able to do that again. And, And I understand that reality, but you also have to ask yourself, will I come away from this and enjoy anything? If I spend all of my time in the car, will I start to just become so exhausted 
that I'm not appreciating what I'm doing. And that's where you need to just scale it down. And it also becomes dangerous. So the more exhausted you become, the more you're driving, especially with an RV, and you're just go, 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 go. Then that's also when accidents happen. It's more, it, as Carrie mentions here, it's also more strain on the driver to, to drive an RV. It's not like driving a car. And the the time it takes to get somewhere is longer. So mm-hmm. if you have that Google Maps estimate, we add 15 minutes per hour. Uh, a new newbie might want to add out 30 minutes per hour of Google time, mm-hmm. you know, to really get an idea of how long it takes to get somewhere. It's just not the same as driving a car at 75 miles an hour. Yeah, not to mention that by the time you get to your campsite, you get set up. Really, the last thing you should be doing is then rushing off to try and explore with as many, you know, hours you have left of daylight as possible, because then you're not also enjoying your campsite. You're running all over the place. You're trying to get everything crammed in because, hey, we're out of here in two days and we got to move on to our next stop. That's just something that we also have had to deal with over the years. And I know people probably think that sounds silly as full timers working from the road, homeschooling from the road, living life on the road. We cannot go into a place and treat it like we're on vacation. So we have to be very specific and deliberate about what we do. We'll link to the article that has a lot more great nuggets uh, from Carrie Cox over at Togo RV in the show notes and in the description for this episode. But go over to togorv.com and and click on the RV lifestyle section, and they've got lots of great articles on all sorts of subjects. Yeah, and if you have the Togo RV app, just a reminder that Jason and I have a class in their university on RV buying. So, you know, if you want even more of us talking... It's over there. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, our trip to Jacksonville, Florida. We'll be right back. Electrical surge protection is one of the cheapest insurance policies you can provide for your RV. And the Power Watchdog Smart Surge Protector, made by Hughes Auto Formers, beats the competition with field replaceable surge modules. With other brands, when the surge protector takes a large surge or a spike, you have to throw it away. The Power Watchdog can be brought back to life with one small affordable part you can replace yourself. They'll even give you a free surge module in the first two years and now have a limited lifetime warranty. Use the coupon code RVMILES, all one word, for 10% off your order at HughesAutoFormers.com. That's code RVMILES for 10% off at HughesAutoFormers.com. Chances are you've seen them on the road. That's because Blue Ox has been designing and manufacturing some of the best towing products in the industry. Blue Ox is everywhere, highways, campgrounds, anywhere you find people traveling in the great outdoors. Blue Ox produces award-winning tow bars and base plates, plus a full line of weight distributing hitches and a new lineup of adjustable ball mounts. With Blue Ox, towing doesn't have to be a drag. To learn more about how Blue Ox can make your travel adventures even more stress-free, visit blueox.com. All right, we are back, and it is time to talk about our time in Jacksonville, Florida. We spent so much time in inland Florida, in Orlando, and then in the Madison, Tallahassee area. It was finally nice to get out to the coast and, and be really right on the ocean in Jacksonville at Huguenot Memorial Park. We couldn't have been happier to be back there. And we alluded to it so many times because we were back and kind of like in our element, we were in a county park. There was only electric. So, you know, we were filling up the fresh water and we were conserving the water. And it was fantastic. We were just right there on the beach. And it just, it felt so Good. I mean, there's, you know, it's nice to have full hookups and it's nice to do the private campground, but boy, there's just nothing like being in a federal, state, or county park. This park uh, is only $27 a night. Like Abby said, it's electric only, but they do have a dump station and water fill uh, there. The water fill was very difficult for us to get our big rig to. And we should say that it is 50 amp. So Mm -hmm. they do have 30 and That's good, especially when it gets hot here. Absolutely. The sites were. This was another thing I loved, too. And this is, again, the difference between a lot of the state parks and the private parks was our site was so big. The sites are a little odd in the way that they are set up. I would say that, you know, especially the pull through sites are wider than they are long. Our 43 foot fifth wheel fit 
just fine. But well, we did have to park the truck uh, at a bit of an angle just to like get it in there. And to back into the site, we actually we did have to back into the pull through site. Yeah. And we had to come through another site to do it. Yeah. And uh, it's the f- park is all full of one lane roads that but they're you not don't, marked. You, you don't know which direction you're supposed to go <laughs> on know. them. The sites aren't really angled. You know, normally a pull through would yeah. be angled so that you can pull into it the right way. They're all kind of at a 90 degree angle to the road, which is hard. It is, again, one of those parks that was built, designed, I think, when we were all in slightly smaller RVs. And it hasn't had the update that it really does need because honestly, there should be, in my opinion, about five or six less sites. But if this was a campground sort of in the middle of nowhere that had nothing around it but trees or something, yeah. it's not the type of place that you would love. Oh, no. Uh, but the but we were literally able to walk a uh, 100 feet to be on the beach. Oh, it was incredible. And there also seemed to be across from us on the other side. So, you know, you had some beach access on one side and then behind us, it did seem that there was... Like a naval shipyard? A naval- uh, it, it's a naval air station. So there there were helicopters in and out constantly. We're getting a, a lot of noise from that. But it was really cool to see ships coming out because this is where the also the a, a lot of the big container ships were yeah. coming in and out through this inlet. So that was really cool to see over there. And then on the other side, you just had people paddle boarding, kayaking, canoeing, parasailing. And it's obviously a really popular place for the community. Very much a, a party campground on the weekends. Except, so the first weekend, it was very party. Mm-hmm. And then the second weekend, it Not was very much. quiet. Yeah. So I think we also got mixed in a little bit with spring break. But it's fun. Sometimes that atmosphere of the energy that people bring when they're coming for the weekend and they're coming to the beach. And there were a lot of tent campers, which I also think just being around a lot of tent campers is very energizing because they just do everything sort of like back to nature in kind of a way. It's very hard to describe, but I loved the atmosphere. Nobody I ever felt was disrespectful. We did have the one group that did play their music so loud during the day that it was like we were all joining them. But thankfully, it was all music we liked. So we didn't need to turn music on. (laughs) So we just enjoyed their music all day long when we were outside. But I would say my biggest, even outside of the odd way we had to get into our spot, like for me, the biggest annoyance was the wind. By the end of the nine days... I had it with the 20 to 30 mile per hour daily wind. It's gusts. just you're very exposed. There's lots of palm trees around you, yeah. but you're basically out on a peninsula uh, surrounded by ocean and it is very open to wind and we were getting a lot of it. And I think some of that too is the time of year. And We had several storms come through as well. So I think that plays a lot into it. It's just the spring in the south. But boy, I mean, the sand just kicking around and stuff. I mean, it's kind of great in the beginning because you're like, oh, I'm beach camping. Then by the end, you're like, oh, I'm beach camping. It's time to go. (laughs) So this place is, it's nice because it's easy access to Jacksonville, um, but you are still removed from Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. So you've got, it is a bit of a driving distance to actually get into town, but that's nice because you feel like you're out in nature and then you can do big city things too if you want to. Yeah, it was about 30. 35 minutes to the nearest grocery store from where we are, which was an improvement because when we were in Madison to get to Tallahassee was an hour. So that was an improvement. It was a little bit shorter. But, you know, if you do go in, one of the great things about Jacksonville is that, especially for national park enthusiasts, you have this incredible national park uh, preserve and also a couple of a memorial and then also, I believe, um, a historical site. All just like lumped in together. In fact, it's all part of the Timucuan Ecological and Forest Preserve. And this, the Timucuan were the native people to this area. And this preserve is huge. If you get a chance to look at the map, it encompasses where you're staying in Huguenot Memorial Park, as well as all up and along into Little Talbot Island. And then it goes up into the north and parts of Jacksonville. And fantastic hiking to be had. And for us, right down the street from where we were, 
was the Kingsley Plantation, and that is part of the National Park Service. And you can go there, you can tour. It's only open on the weekends for tours. There's hiking through there, but it is, from what I understand, one of the best preserved plantations that we have to, in order to really be able to talk about what life was like for uh, not only those enslaved, but then also the plantation owners. We took a drive by, we took the loop drive around it, not yeah. something you want to do in an RV, uh, uh, but we no. took the loop drive near it and it was really uh, kind of a beautiful drive, but on rough roads and took a yeah. while to get back there. But we didn't actually get to go to that. But we did get to go to the main visitor center for the Tamuquin Ecological and Forest Preserve, which actually was about an hour drive away from mm-hmm. the campground. And there you get to see a reconstruction of the fort that the Huguenot settlers made when they arrived in the area. And what's interesting about that is Abby is a descendant of the Huguenots, which were a French religious sect that was escaping religious persecution. Yeah. And hey, look, full disclosure, I didn't put two and two together (laughs) at the campground we were staying at until I was in this visitor center and I was reading this. And then I went, oh, my gosh, that's named after like my French ancestors. And then I felt really silly. But this is the Fort Caroline National Memorial. And as we were just saying, the Tamuquin were here long before any Europeans came over and set foot on this earth. But the French Huguenots who were escaping persecution and, and looking for some riches came here in the late 16th century, around 1560, and immediately began to construct this fort, and they were going to occupy and create this empire here, and then they had some issues with Spain, and there was quite an awful slaughter uh, between the Huguenots and the Spaniards, and eventually Spain just took back over this area, and they occupied it the for whole quite state. some time. Yeah. And so it's very fascinating, because it does offer a glimpse into more European history and puts the European stamp that was placed on this country into even more of a perspective than what we often kind of start to see around the Mayflower. And I mean, here we're talking 16th century, 1560, 1562. And so this isn't the actual structure. They believe that this is the site and they've got, you know, some stuff to help them get an idea of what it should look like. But what I lo- what I found really fascinating was there was, do you remember that painting? Yeah, it was that, etching, like an illustration, a yeah, European illustration. That someone had done of this area and what it would have looked like. And it was sort of um, exalting the French Huguenots and what the land looked like and what they were trying to do here. And it, it was done several years after this had been an unsuccessful occupation. And they had the Floridian landscape with giant mountains in the background. I mean, you know, so we talked a lot about that too, what it must have been like for Europeans to come here, especially coming from France, and to land in an area like Florida with bugs and yeah. humidity and no mountains. No, yeah. there's no mountains here. So All right. that was one of the other best parts of being able to get back to this type of camping, which Mm -hmm. we love, is to be able to go back to National Park Service sites, which it's been quite a while for us. Um, And I, I, I think we all had a lot of fun doing that. Yeah, and I shared a little reel of it, just a really quick snippet of what this looked like over on YouTube on the RV Miles podcast YouTube channel under our shorts. But then I do also believe it's up on Our Wandering Family on Instagram as well, if you would just like to see what the area looked like and what we did that day. We did get to use the national, the new National Park Service app for the first yeah. time. This app just came cool. out last year, and they had, at this site, they had put in an audio tour into the app. If, if you've been to a lot of National Park Service sites, often they have their own, like, websites that you go in and you find, like, an audio tour app, or there's written things that you're going to read to everybody. But Mm -hmm. this was really convenient. Like you open the app and you click a button and it shows you the audio tours nearby. And we did a sort of short 10 stop audio tour on this trail that we were on around the around Fort Caroline. And it was great. It was absolutely fantastic. I look forward to using that app some more. Uh, A few other things that we did in the area. We did eat at a local restaurant that's actually not far from the campground. If you're looking for someone and you don't want to have to drive very far into town, you can go and have dinner at Sand Dollar. It's 
a primarily um, seafood focused restaurant, as a lot of places in Jacksonville are. Jason made the mistake of ordering a steak. Yeah, steak wasn't great, um, but it but was- my mahi was <laughs> fantastic. There's not a lot of places to eat around Huguenot Park, and and here uh, is one of sort of like the waterfront type restaurants. When we arrived, there's a sign and the the oh, yeah. lady at the desk, the host, was saying that it will be an hour wait. And then an hour, another hour wait for your food. So <laughs> we were really, we put our names in and then we're trying to figure out something else to do. And while we're trying to figure out something else to do, they called us in. So it was only it was like, like five minutes. a five minute wait for us to get a table. However, we did wait an hour. We for waited food. more than an hour for food because we still ate at the time we would have yeah. eaten at. But. Yeah, we definitely waited longer. And that was fine. The kids were playing games and we were with some friends. So that always helps too to pass the time. But, you know, I think if you want to go and have some good, like, uh, peel and eat shrimp uh, and you want to have some seafood, then this is definitely your place. They're supposedly, they have world famous hush puppies. Jason and I did not get to enjoy those, but uh, they did look world famous to me. That was a real, real hard one to pass up. So that's our short time in Jacksonville, Florida. We're going to take a break and we're going to come back and check the level of our tanks. If you've been thinking about picking up a solo stove, now is the perfect time. During the off season, Solo Stove continues to offer discounts on their popular low smoke fire pits, including our favorite, the Bonfire. RV Miles listeners can save even more money by heading over to rvmiles.com slash solo stove and using the link and promo code. Take advantage of all the discounts to be had before camping season starts and get your Solo Stove today. RVMiles.com slash solo stove, and then click the link and use the promo code to save even more. All right, we are back, and it is time, as we do every week, to check the level of our tanks. Jason, what is in your black tank this week? So, so the other day, uh, I was taking a shower in the RV, like and I'm going through the routine. I'm soaked everything up my hair is full of shampoo my face is covered in soap and getting ready to rinse off and the water goes (laughs) just disappears water completely stops the campground water shut off just before i rinsed myself off (laughs) So, yeah. you know, and I and I was concerned that it was something wrong with our site. Maybe we like, oh, yeah. blew a pipe or something like that. So I was like yelling at Abby. She was outside to come in and then to go check outside. But I couldn't tell her what to do because she had already ran back outside and was looking around at stuff. And what I wanted to tell her was turn the water pump on so I can rinse off. I just thought maybe there was a little kink or something. Like, it's just going to fix Yeah, the, like the hose could have been kinked or something. But anyway, finally she came back inside and I was able to say, turn the water pump on. And thankfully we had a little water in the tank. Just probably enough. Just enough for me to rinse off. <laughs> we came here from Jacksonville. So when we left Jacksonville after nine days, we were down yeah. to the end of the water. And we did not think to put any in the tank, which I now maybe we need to always make sure we've got at least a third or whatever that scientific graph c- claims is a third now that you just recently <laughs> did. Well, um, I, I, but it, at least you got rinsed. It off. sounds like somebody ran over a water spigot and they shut the water off. Yeah, they said it. that it was an emergency yeah. repair and that it would be on which, a, as soon as they could get it back. That on. happens a lot in these tight campgrounds where the water spigot's out in the middle and sometimes they're pvc pipes and people run them over because they're not near the electric box and they see the electric box or they're stressed out because people are watching them you know and they end up hitting something but thankfully it wasn't off for too long and we did have enough water for you to finish your shower all right what is in your fresh tank this week oh my fresh tank is betty reed soskin who is a national park service ranger or at least is up until i think two days from when we're recording saturday this. the beginning of national uh, park Week. she is a hundred years old and is a national park ranger and i think is retiring at rosie the riveter where Amazing. you know she tells the story of world war ii and and, and black history and the wow. women's involvement in world war ii and and women's history in this country anyway 100 years old old, the oldest working national park service ranger is finally getting a well-deserved retirement 
That's just incredible. I, I to be she was born in like nineteen twenty one, nineteen twenty two. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So anyway, good for her. And I hope that she gets to enjoy this retirement. What is in your black tank this week? So we made a reservation at a campground recently and it was a very pricey reservation. We're headed to Rocky Mountain National Park for the first time ever. Six years on the road, we still hadn't made it to the Rocky Mountain National Park. So we're treating ourselves this summer and we're going. So I made a reservation at one of the private campgrounds because some of the other places like Mary's Lake and all that were booked because again, I'm late to the party. And um, in order to make this reservation, they want 50% of the reservation. And that's fine. That part I don't care about. That's fine. I was happy to pay that. Uh, When I asked about the cancellation fee, I was told that we would be refunded none of the money and we would just get credited to another trip. But then we would also get a fee for having to move that reservation. So like, not only do I not get any of my money back, but then I get charged more. And I know that you know, a lot of you are probably yelling at me right now because I've been yelling about how no shows and all this stuff and how it's not a stricter policy and all these things. And if people will hold their reservation, if we hold them to it, but this is too much for me. I can understand having a cancellation fee that is really strong, but when I have to give you over $500 And then you tell me I'm not going to get any of that money back. And on top of that, if I have to cancel and I need to shift, that you're going to charge me a fee to do so when I know for a fact you will sell that campsite because it's July. No, I can understand if you're not if you're not going to give me a refund if I'm canceling a couple days beforehand. Absolutely. That there's nothing. But if if, here we are, it's April. If I call next month, doesn't matter. It does not matter. And I think that this kind of like really, really far to the extreme frustrates me a little bit because it also makes me think, is your campground not very good so that you people want to cancel so much that I don't know. Campgrounds need to become more flexible. They're very busy right now, so they don't have the, they don't have to right now. In the future, they're going to need to become more flexible with stuff like that. I would have paid the whole thing. But it's more about the fact that it's just, it's so, it's just a hard, hard line in an area that can take a really, really hard line like that. Because this particular campground, the management company pretty much owns every other campground in that area. So they can do whatever they want and get away with it. But here's the other issue is they want, they email you a, credit card authorization form yeah. to fill out sign and send back to them what century is this it's one of the many things and like you said when we were talking about that this is so they have your signature on file so that if you do have yeah. to cancel you can't do a charge back on your card yeah, that's what it's all about. that's yeah. all that it's about and they you know it was like for anything over four hundred dollars And I was, we were very cordial on the phone. Like there was no, you know, animosity or anything. But like I got off the phone thinking, oh, so like every time someone books a two night stay, essentially you're sending them this because that's how expensive it is in your peak season. That's just so much busy work. It's so much busy work. And yes, you're right. What is this, 1999? All right, what's your fresh tank this week? (laughs) So my fresh tank, and one of the reasons why we're going to Rocky Mountain National Park and we're going to some of the places that we're going over this next year plus is because we're back um, to traveling with friends. And I'm fresh tanking traveling with friends because I think for anyone who has been fortunate enough to find a family or individuals or a person that meets their travel lifestyle and 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 you can travel with those people and you can feel the joy of that is this really incredible gift and we're with a family right now that we met back in September that we have just really connected with and we're going to be spending a decent amount of time with them and then over the summer we're going to get to see our friends that we spent pretty much the entire pandemic traveling with and we're going to be with them for a while. I'm not particularly one that wants to have a big caravan of people and I don't need to have a ton of people in my life that I travel with. 
But I can say that if you've been on the fence or you thought it might be weird to travel with friends or exhausting or a lot of extra work, I can only say that it has been one of the most enriching parts of our life on the road. Absolutely. And it's enriching for our kids, but it's also enriching for Jason and I to have friends. It's great to have a friend to go shopping with. It's great to have a, have friends to play a card game with at night or just sit around and drink a bottle of wine with. To those families who, for whatever reason, want to travel with our craziness, we're so glad you do. And thank you for doing it with it because you make our lives better. That's a great place to end this episode. <laughs> it's a very good place to end this episode. And if you're keeping track, I'm still on hold. Now I've been on hold for two and a half hours. And at this point, I can't get off. I've given two and a half hours to Typhoon Lagoon. They're going to answer and be like, nope, not available. I, yes, None. this is going to this is going to be the golf cart thing all over again. It, it will be, but that's okay. It's okay because look at all the work I still get done. This is why AirPods are amazing. I just plug them in and I keep going about my life. So anyway, maybe sometime tonight they'll answer. Thank you so much for joining us this week. As a friendly reminder, head over to Amazon, do your shopping, but take us with you. Just go to amazon.com slash shop slash RV miles and we will get a small kickback from anything you purchase in the Amazon sphere. And of course, we do hope you will come find us on social media. We are RV Miles all over the place and especially in the RV Miles Facebook group. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Stay well, stay safe, and keep logging those RV Miles. Hi, everybody. 